Hello and welcome to FuturePod. I'm Peter Hayward. FuturePod gathers voices from the international field of futures and foresight. Through a series of interviews, the founders of the field and the emerging leaders share their stories, tools and experiences. Please visit futurepod.org for further information about this podcast series. Today, our guest is Roger Spitz. Roger Spitz is the founder of Texistential and the Disruptive Futures Institute. As the former head of technology mergers and acquisitions with BNP Paribas, Roger has two decades experience leading investment banking businesses, advising CEOs, founders, boards, and shareholders of companies globally. With an early career in venture capital, Roger remains an ardent supporter of venture-backed ecosystems. He is a contributing writer to MIT Technology Review, an advisor and speaker on artificial intelligence, and has also invested in a number of AI startups. Roger is a member of the Association of Professional Futurists, the Foresight Institute, the World Future Study Federation, and most importantly, is a Patreon of FuturePod. Welcome to FuturePod, Roger. Hey, Peter. It's such a pleasure to be on, on FuturePod with you. Um, and if I may, may say as an introduction, and I, when I think about the list of uh, eminent colleagues and founders of the Foresight field you, you've had on the conversations with, I'm really honored to be included in that. It's fantastic to get the, commu- the breadth of the community appreciated by the community, Roger. So question one, the Roger Spitz story, what is it? Yeah, so there are two, two almost distinct phases to it. And I think for your discerning listeners, I'm tempted to give, to give both of those, the more recent story and the professional side, but also the real drivers and looking at um, the longer timeframes. As you said, I spent a lot of time working in the more kind of corporate envi- environment, you know, advising um, <clears throat> on strategic transactions, M&A, and, and other things. And I, I felt during much of that time that the way things were moving in terms of accelerating, whether it's technology or, or for want of a better word, disruption, I just felt that it was more and more difficult to have that narrow and shorter time frame, which went with a lot of the strategic advice or the strategic playbooks when you're looking at organizations and how you can help them future-proof. And somehow felt that the real challenges and debates for the boardroom were no longer around these transactions. And so as I looked at these industries, which could pretty much you know <laughs> disappear or be reshaped overnight, the startups coming out of nowhere with new platforms, and eating everybody's lunch, and the incumbents being, you know, sometimes very brutally and, and quickly displaced. For me, the question was really, okay, how do I look at the drivers to that? How do I connect the dots as to what's really happening? And that was the beginning of the journey for me, the, the recent phase of the journey. I'll get back to the origins a bit later. And that that was probably, you know, six or seven years ago when I wanted to really understand radical transformation. At the time, I was still in London covering globally, for the past few years I've been in in San Francisco. And I took the opportunity to really spend time with institutions and organizations around, you know, understanding better disruption and innovation. And that journey led me to spending a bit of time at Santa Fe Institute for Complexity and Systems Thinking, Institute for the Future here in Palo Alto, our friends at the University of Houston, and also a little bit with MIT on MI and strategy. And that that was effectively, I felt that an umbrella of futures and foresight, the way I understood it, was a good way of looking at longer timeframes, more radical transformation and, and those themes. But the real genesis, and this is where I just want to spend a few minutes, because this is actually the, the interesting thing, is that I discovered existential philosophy and the concepts of agency and contingency when I was at school. And I was fascinated by that. And actually, anecdotally, Tech Essential, which is the name I give my practice, is technology and existential. Mm. And I didn't think at the time, you know, when I moved to becoming a maybe more um, capitalist investment banker and maybe <laughs> <laughs> more narrow perception of the world, that I would be able to reconnect so well with these overriding concepts of how, you know, in a way, defining agency and contingency, when you're thinking about the different plausible futures or what one prefers, how intrinsic that is to that process. And so for me, I studied economics at university. I then spent, you know, 20 years investment banking. But the real 
time I spent at university and at school, and even you know more recently, was really reading into existentialist philosophy and the likes of Heidegger and Kierkegaard and Sartre. It's only more recently that I re- almost came full circle when I think about you know Sartre's lecture on existentialism as humanism, you know, man first of all exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world and defines himself afterwards. Understanding that that is really the crux. You're defining yourself with agency for your futures, and that is not deterministic. And so that is really the kind of more full circle journey that that I went through. Mm. It doesn't always happen, but certainly I saw it a number of times teaching people foresight. People, while they had an external interest, also had a deep internal longing to be able to understand themselves and their circumstance as well as understanding this emerging thing around them. It's so true. And, you know, I was thinking back, and it's funny how all this, it's almost like I blanked out 20 years of my life and it's coming back to me. But some of my, you know, one of my favorite movies of all times is Smoking No Smoking, which is, an, yeah. it's, you know, as you probably know, and for some, for, in case anyone doesn't, it's Alain René, and he has two movies where at the beginning... There's, you know, in one the person goes outside in the garden and smokes a cigarette and doesn't hear the doorbell ring and everything, you know, for the next two hours or what have you based on, you know, in the movie is, is on that premise and that outcome that they didn't hear the door ring. And then the other one, they hear the door ring. And so a number of events mm-hmm. take place. And for me, when I think back, that's, you know, that's really an illustration of contingency. And I remember just being so fascinated with that. And for the same reasons as I was with existential philosophy and agency, it's that sort of different outcomes and, and the variability. Yes, it one of the films that caught my personal sense of confusion, which is probably the abiding sense that I have about things, is um, <laughs> is lost in translation, which yeah. this this notion that you there is something going on around you You know you're kind of part of it, but at the same time, you're also just an observer. So, yes, you are a participant and you have a form of agency and there's contingency, but there is also this sort of, it can feel as helplessness or it can feel as this kind of observed position, which, again, I think goes with the Eastern philosophical perspectives, um, you know, like Buddhism and, and, Mm -hmm. and certainly Zen, which is... One way to understand it is to step out of even the notion of agency and and contingency. Yeah, no, that that's an amazing movie, and you're right. If we dig in, and we could probably spend a few weeks on this. This, you know, it, it kind of reminds me. I'm going to mention it anyway, although we should should move on. If not, we're going to spend an hour on on movie buff things. But um, the Double Life of Veronique by Kieslowski, which again has that un- underlying theme around contingent outcomes and people and are you an observer or are you the agent and, and anyway a number of the themes you're mentioning it's it's fascinating yeah. so that's a personal journey which i appreciate the the question i often ask is are, are there people which might be people that you knew or knew you or people that never knew you that actually supported or kind of somehow scaffolded or encouraged the journey yeah, so the first phase I mentioned, the, the, the older phase in terms of philosophy, I actually had a, a philosophy teacher at school. So this is, you know, a few years ago called Fornerys, and I was in, in the French system. I was in Monaco at the time. And, and he, he brought me a lot of what I was thinking and, and fed me a lot of, you know, different um, elements. Because actually I didn't, I, I studied philosophy very superficially compared to, you know, if you use the term study. I didn't study it deeply at university. I certainly didn't do a PhD. But I'd say in the more recent journey, both Andy and Peter brought a lot in terms of the University of Houston. That's that's mm-hmm. more recent, but you know, obviously very very important to me. And then within Santa Fe Institute, although I don't know him, but people like Scott Page. You know, when you listen and follow around complexity, these are obviously very you know <laughs> very. They have a big impact on you, on me, they certainly do it. And I'm, I'm going to give you an anecdote. I know the different views on you know, technology, and I don't want to narrow to it. But I, I spent a few sessions with Singularity University here in the Valley. And there was one morning, I think in the same morning, I had Ray Kurzweil, who <laughs> you know, has a very interesting perspective on many things. And you know, not least, he's running, you know, pretty much building Google's brain as he, as he runs their machine learning activities there, right? 
And I then I think had Paul Sappho, who's you know sits on the Long Now Foundation wow. and has you know decades exploring dynamics of large change and long term change and all that. And and John Hagel, who also is I think on the board of you know Santa Fe Institute and obviously founder of the Deloitte Center of Edge and that. And I can tell you when you come in for breakfast in a morning like that and you have three or four of the, <laughs> of those kind of almost back to back, you you don't kind of leave that. Um, at the time, it was at the NASA Research Center. <laughs> you don't leave in the same kind of mindset that when you arrived. And that you know no. that that was a big influence for me. <laughs> it's always struck me how we are attracted to enormous, enormous brains. They are intensely attractive, but I often wonder if they seem to have a grasp and a confidence and we are attracted to as much their seeming grasp and confidence as much as the things they talk about. That's a very deep and good question. Yeah, it's uh, it's really the eternal question, right? I think when you look at some of the thinking about some of the readings on you know plato and relaying the discussions with socrates and around you know some of these themes these are yeah these are very good how you know ultimately how well confidence not is a more of a modern term but you know the existential questions are kind of overriding everything right including around the self and one's beingness Let's go to question two because obviously there's a bit going on for you in how you make sense of the world. You've got a lot of experience and some interesting frames on both the external world and the internal world. So the second question, I encourage the guests to talk about you know, methods and frameworks that are core to their practice. So what do you want to talk to the listeners about? Yeah, so there's there's a huge amount to draw on, and admittedly, compared to you know many, if not most of my peers, I'm relatively new to the field. You know, it's it's years instead of decades. Um, so maybe that's easier actually to choose because of how rich and nuanced the future studies are and and what I know of it. But from my perspective, where I'm spending a lot of time, and it's been very helpful to have some of these frameworks, is around complex adaptive systems and constantly thinking really in terms of systems, and in particular. Complexity. I think it's Stephen Hawking who sort of said that uh, you know the 21st century is is a century of complexity. And one framework for me, which I I constantly refer to, is uh, Dave Snowden's the Kinevin framework. Mm. And in particular, the distinction between complicated and complex, and the sense making, depending on what domain you're in, and. For me, the important thing there is really the ramifications as to then, you know, all the emergent practices and the problem solving, which which go with that kind of feedback loop, you know, the amplifying, the dampening and the, the everything we know. But for me, the reason why I find that so important is because I've tried to use it from a practical perspective, um, number one. So I've developed a lot of adaptations to the framework and developing that those for, you know, what does it mean that unknown unknowns, no right answers, and where things are best messily coherent. And what I've tried to do is use it a lot, that distinction between complex and complicated, because I, I somehow sense that more and more, whether it's, you know, individuals, organizations, or companies, or governments, we are almost permanently and messily in that complex quadrant. And so that then, for me, leads me to to not just sort of thinking about, oh, when are we in complex, but more the fact that it's it's more of a constant. And so when I think about within that, how important innovation is to allow the instructive patterns to emerge. And so for me, then it comes to really innovation and understanding the inflection points, the tipping points, you know, the S-curves, which are, you know, understanding the nonlinear relationships and, and trying to think about everything in that context of complexity, because I personally feel that that is the way the world is evolving. And I recently wrote a piece, in fact, on AI, on that assumption that, you know, AI, I think today is quite good in in complicated quadrants to use Dave Snowden's framework, but less so in complexity. But the question I raise and the reason why I really try and spend time on this is AI is learning somehow to deal with some of the variables around complexity. And are we as humans spending enough time 
managing that better? And, and how might, not that it's a race, but how might those dynamics of AI maybe possibly getting some traction around how it evolves around complexity and, and humans? And so that brings me to the last piece to your question, well, to to last framework, which is the three horizons. I really love the framework by, you know, Curry and, and Hodgson around that. I use it a lot all the time because it's very intuitive, but it's not less powerful nonetheless. And so when we look at some of the things we've talked about, you know, I kind of project, you know, how might, what might it mean if you take those three horizons for AI or for humanity or for different scenarios? It's a fascinating idea. I I read a lot of science fiction. I'm currently rereading a lot of the classic science fictions. It's, it's a lovely to go back to. But You're touching on a notion of what AI can teach us, which up until now we've definitely thinking that we're the ones that are designing AI to serve us. But I'm interested in this pivot of how might the way machine learning cope with complexity, how might that happen? How could we even just lean into this notion of what can machine learning teach humans? to do well the way the way i look at it and you know again it doesn't mean it's it's the right answer i'm sure it isn't but it's acknowledging what ai is good at which is primarily ai is extremely good at you know when there's cause and effect and when there are known unknowns and where there's a range of right answers it's processing that data right so that typically is ai's comfort zone the complicated and once you realize that you realize that you as humans maybe shouldn't be spending too much time on on knowledge or expertise or having the right answer or being a specialist or or areas which are just where there's a good understanding of cause and effect because ultimately that's where AI will will thrive on. Conversely, it means that you need to to think about what's required to be to be able to evolve and cohabitate in a in a sort of fruitful way with AI in the more complex, because what's sure is that AI, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a sort of given that AI will thrive in complexity, but what is a given is that it's going to continue to try and learn. And I think as humanity, we need to think about upping the game maybe in terms of what it means to, to be, do well in complex. And so to answer your question, for me, what can AI teach us? I think AI can teach us that we should be more discerning in terms of where we bring value to that relationship with AI, like it or not. And if you think about the current institutions and the leadership skills and the education system, which is knowledge-based, I'm not sure it's cognizant of you know, what we should be registering, which is what are the areas we need to beef up and what are the areas which mm. probably it's going to be more difficult for humanity to be differentiated and have the right kind of relationship with AI if we just, you know, take education, if it's just knowledge driven, you know, I'll let you sort of think about how valuable knowledge is in the complex domains, right? Yeah. I'm hearing a version of Ricardo's comparative advantage uh, economic theory in that oh. in that argument. But I'm also interested, as I'm sure you are, in the work that's happening where they're using AI in areas like poetry and music and they're letting technology create what we would characterize as artistic work and measuring the relative quality of what essentially seems to be a creative act out of nothing because I'm fascinated by that whether people think the poetry is any good or the music is interesting or beautiful or whatever else I mean I'm very interested in the possibility of there being an aesthetic dimension to artificial intelligence. Yeah, and I think the short answer is there's starting to be. I think um, AI is starting to tackle even what was considered to be an area of exclusivity for humans, which is, you know, creativity. And there was actually very interesting, uh, you know, there's a British choreographer in ballet called Wayne McGregor who who's, who's you know, an amazing choreographer. And he basically worked with Google Arts to basically train AI on to do the choreography of, of dancers. And it's debatable as to whether it's better, worse, wrong, right, or whatever. The fact is that it, you know, it has artistic value and that people like Wayne McGregor are teeing up with that for that relationship, which he considers to be synergistic. And, and as you correctly say, there's a, 
there's a large number of, you know, from music to dance to all kinds of things. So, it again, I guess the, the debate then becomes, you know, there's a, there's a value element as to how that compares to what humans can do. There's a question of, you know, who's on whose turf and doesn't matter <laughs> um, in terms of the symbiotic or otherwise relationship. And there's also a question of where does that leave humans to find work as you currently do in terms of the spectrum of roles and the value chain with work and um, humans can do to, you know, to earn a living or what have you. The other aspect here which is the, if I say that, the Western cultural fear of technology. And I want to juxtapose that with what seemingly seems, if you look at the Japanese treatment of technology, and it's much more what apparently seems to be a more symbiotic relationship with technology. To what extent are we culturally limited to embrace technology? In other words, will we always fear it if it gets too smart, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big dilemma, and you're right. It's interesting in Japan how you know, believe to you see with longevity and with empathy and different roles you're giving machines. It's a different, it's a different relationship. But I think the you know there are different levels of of the discussion, and we could spend a lot of time on it. These are very interesting discussions, and I, I personally am you know my biggest worry with with AI is really in terms of how radically transforming it is for areas which today the world is not prepared for and you know yeah. if you redefine work and revenue and and basic necessities in a different way in the future that that's fine but today we haven't done that yet and so i get a little bit concerned when it's a bit like climate change when people talk, tell you oh alexa don't can't even understand what my shopping is and make that sort of immediate rash assumption as to how useless ai is which is which is true to a degree but I think they forget the speed with which things can evolve and how radically transforming it can be and, and the impact it will have on so many things. And that's where, for me, the debate is important because that's, you know, people's livelihoods and its education system. And it's a lot of, lot of things which we're just not ready yet to, to address. I'm hearing in that, Roger, that it's, it's actually not the fear of the impacts of the technology. It's the fear that our current governance systems and educative systems and support systems are ready to support people who are affected by such disruption. Yeah, I think that's right. And how are we preparing the next generations to, you know, a lot of the education is still knowledge driven, right? So what does it mean to go into something which, you know, you're teaching by the time they come out of school? the professions or whatever they're learning to do have radically changed or, or or disappeared or what have you, you know. So that's that's a real consideration for billions of people. And that's that's where I kind of spend time worrying from a practical perspective. If you fast forward and you know it doesn't matter whether you reach artificial general intelligence, it doesn't matter whether it's five, ten years or twelve and a half years. The point is the direction which with that is going and the lack of kind of preparation or change which is required to, to cohabitate with, with whatever direction technology and AI is taking. It's not doing that at a slow pace. Thanks, Roger. So let's, I think we're heading towards the third question, which is how does Roger Spitz make sense of the emerging futures around him? <laughs> yeah, so... I've tried to improve on that recently over the past years. I've tried to, and that's mainly through reconnecting with um, the existentialist philosophy I mentioned. I think I had a, a phase in my professional life where I just felt if you do certain things, it brings you to certain outcomes and it gives you certain visibility and the world is you know, pretty straightforward in that. And what's happened more recently over the past few years, which for me has been phenomenal, is to be able to reconnect with existentialist philosophy, and which I almost apply an existential framework to to my own decision making and to my life, and so it's really thinking about you know Jean Paul Sartre and people like Gilles Deleuze around the frameworks, which for me are actually directly linked to emergence and to to the things we talked about with complexity. Because in a way, if you look at properties such as our ability to define your own beingness, right, you exist and then you create your essence. You do that through curiosity and innovation and experimentation. And in a way, it's 
it's by allowing our essence through these instructive patterns to emerge in these complex systems. And so because I more and more believe that the world is, you know, not predetermined and is complex and there's no right answer necessarily, cause and effect, and you can throw the playbook out of the window. So I draw parallels with existentialist philosophy and I consider, okay, if you have a problematic, it exists, then you define your emerging essence through basically the choices and the decision you make. So in a way, it's it's really when Sartre, I guess, formulated existence precedes the essence. And of course, he did that, you know, standing on the shoulders of Kierkegaard and Heidegger and the likes. What he meant is the essence of being human is the existence through which the essence becomes defined through choice. And therefore, our agency emerges through these choices. And so it's a little bit of a maybe funny way of describing it. But for me, it's just to continue to, you know, to make the choices, to embrace this emergence and not to relinquish to those decisions and to the fact that you're defining yourself. So if I was, you know, thinking in terms of Deleuze's terminology, existence is unknowable and indeterminate. And therefore, it's through through the problem-solving framework we discussed, defining your essence as it emerges, moving in a defining direction, you're dampening or amplifying the things you do. That effectively helps me evolve day to day without worrying about is it the wrong thing? Because there is no right or wrong thing. It's not, the causality is not so simple, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I have literally found it a very, very refreshing way, which is, you know, directly linked to what we started with around agency to think about my future. And in a funny kind of way, that's what also tied me to, to what I decided to professionalize a few years back around, you know, thinking about futures and foresight, because for me, it's almost one and the same concept. Can you apply that approach to the big issue that's around all of us right now is, of course, COVID and both the uh, the impact it's having on us as individuals and then having on us as societies, but also having an impact on the organisations that we're engaged with and also having an impact on the relationships across the world that we're in. So can you sort of move from that that situation which most people would understand through their current structuring of agency and contingency, how do you draw an essence perspective to that? Yeah, because the thing about one of the sort of philosophical debates around creating your essence is that it's not to say that you can do what you want in the sense of being a magician or, or altering, you know, reality or perception or whatever that might be. It's really a question of your choices in terms of how you respond to, to events as well. So some of with you have agency in terms of the event itself, but you still have agency in terms of creating your, your essence by the choices you make. And even if it's just a reaction to something that's external. So that's how I reconcile it. So for me, the pandemic is obviously external and I'm not able to to alter it, but I can have agency around how I choose to respond to it. And personally, I'm trying to sort of be more experimental and, and tinker. I'm trying to be more curious and to to consider that there is no playbook. And if it's basically through my every, you know, every minute I'm I'm there, I exist, I make choices, I make decisions. And effectively, I see how these instructive patterns emerge, how that evolves, and I continue to to make that. And the opposite of that would be, you know, the assumption that maybe things are deterministic or that I might make mistakes because there's a right answer or a reductionist view of the world or trying to predict things and to assume, okay, it's because there's a pandemic, it means that I can't do anything or that because I can't do public speaking and fly to Sao Paulo and, and do that talk that I can't do other things that are equally interesting or, you know, so I'm not, I'm trying to kind of avoid thinking in terms of, you know, necessity for deterministic models or, or prediction. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that, that's yeah. you know, how I think about it. Again, I'm hearing in that this notion of you are allowing essence to emerge as a learned exercise rather than a preconditioned response. Exactly. Because, and again, you know, I don't want to bore you or anyone else too much on this, but 
the, the way I kind of look at the juxtaposition, right, is that on one hand you have, okay, if the essence precedes the existence, it's really, to use kind of usual terms, it's a more kind of stable, predictable, linear world, right? So you have a playbook, there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer, you know, causality is more direct, you have known unknowns, you can predict things, it's more deterministic, it's a reductionist view of the world, but which you're comfortable with. So it's what, it's what Dave Snowden calls the placid normal. Exactly. And also what Nicholas Taleb calls mediocristan. Exactly right. And and what I do in my framework, and actually it's interesting that you raise Nicholas Taleb because I'm, you know, like many a huge fan, what I've just described, I consider to be fragile. And I've actually, I'm, I've just submitted a chapter on this, I hope it will get published, put a sort of existential conception on, on anti-fragile, where I consider fragile to be what I just mentioned, which is, you know, essence precedes the existence, you have prediction, deterministic, reductionism. And in a way, that's a complicated control structures, which are trying to control a simplified environment. And then to go back into a Taleb framework, I'm taking anti-fragile, which is where existence precedes the essence. And I'm saying, okay, that's a simplification of the control f- structures in order to be more responsive to complexity. And so that's the decentralization and all that. And that's where for me, or to use Deleuze's terms, it's the unfolding. So the, re- the reoccurring responsibility of the choices you make for emergence. And that's Taleb's terminology. It's the experimenting, the tinkering. It's, the, um, it's a number of, of things he talks about, but which, which are directly linked to you know, Snowden with emergence and, and that. So it's, you have the problematic that's there, and then effectively you're defining your emerging essence through the choices and decisions. And so Yes, there's a pandemic, but I'm still able to do all that. And actually, I find it quite refreshing rather than, and I think it's refreshing for the entire world because instead of thinking, oh, I didn't do this school or I didn't get that degree or I didn't get into this particular employer or what have you, and therefore a set of events will be dictated from that, Mm. the reality is that it doesn't matter. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we can't do this wrong because we haven't done this before. Exactly. And and what is wrong when there's the unknown unknowns, and there's no right answer, right? On the other side, there are, of course, things that we should reject as possible futures. So, for example, there has we've seen around many, many countries, there has been a, a significant pushback on the notion that we should somehow accept that we let the virus do what it does in order for us to continue our lives. And there has been a genuine, you know, there has been a genuine pushback on countries that have allowed the virus to rip, which is not simply trusting emergence. It's actually saying, no, there are some things that we will actively prevent emerging. You're right. However, what I would say is that the um, it's never so simple, right, to isolate a specific individual or, or country and that. And I think that collectively, if you look at how the world has, you know, emergence in its own right, the framework I, I put around emergence, and you know, I wrote a little piece in the Journal of Future Studies on this, is that for emergence to, to work well, one of the things you, you need is, I talk about anticipatory, being anti-fragile, you know, which we just talked about, and agility. And in the anticipatory piece, it's really not putting your head in the sand and, and lacking complete preparation. I think collectively, one of the reasons there's been such a problem with the, the response to the pandemic is that effectively you have China, which has certain views on privacy or, and ethics or, or otherwise. And so they're able to kind of do things in a way which they're dictating how that works and it keeps a certain control of things. And then for a lot of the rest of the world, on one hand, they have the, the freedom, which, which is very important. But on the other hand, their governments and a lot of the decision makers didn't have the kind of anticipation to think that these things could happen or that you need to prepare for them to, you know, that there's certain things you can do that are more emergent at the earlier stages. So for me, the scrambling in March, once it was already too late on something which was being kind of visible and et cetera, is not emergent. For me, the emergent is is something which you're doing in a reoccurring way. You have a reoccurring responsibility, I think, is Deleuze who uses the, those terms. And so what I think lacks with the emergence around the p- pandemic is that there wasn't this reoccurring responsibility over time in terms of allowing what you've described to happen in a more kind of emergent way, let's say, and because suddenly it was kind of, nothing was anticipated, everything was randomized, and then people scrambled, and then fine, they're calling it 
emergence. I call it improvisation, personally. Yeah. So that's the debate for me. Yeah, so the, you can't say you're trusting emergence when you're simply abrogating your responsibilities. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Thanks, Roger. Well, I'm looking forward to question four because <laughs> how do you explain what you do to people who don't understand what you do? Yeah, indeed. I mean, as a former investment banker, I'd say that I maybe shifted from trading in financial markets to trading in the field of uncertainty. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad, right? Um, <laughs> no, more, more seriously, because there's a, although there's some truth to that, it's hard, but I think it's, it's really an important point to try for all of us to try and find ways of getting the world to understand what we do with foresight and futures. And the reason I think it's extremely important is because it it supports a lot of the transformative change that needed and, and the agency we talked about. So I kind of have three three pieces to the explanation. One which is explore signals, including you know very weak signals on the fringe, try and uncover patterns. Doing that with maybe a historic lens around previous drivers of change, previous drivers of disruption. And then I consider the next order implications and see how they connect the dots. So that's kind of one level, which is pattern, etc. There's a second piece where, which might seem paradoxical, but which at the same time is to expand the foresight zone by challenging assumptions, the what if questions, but at the same time, narrowing the level of uncertainties. And so... By doing so, you're, you're exploring potential outcomes maybe through scenarios while providing agency in terms of understanding that you have a role in terms of having some of those scenarios maybe be more likely or, or for the preferred ones. And so I, I usually then try and wrap it up, which is, for me, it's really opening doors, helping to make better decisions providing perspectives on maybe patterns and inflection points with a very important reminder of how much agency one has around defining one's possible futures. Mm. Where does the notion of the preferable or the choice of what futures we prefer for who? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's the... It's a big question, right? In whose interest is it for, <laughs> for something, mm. an outcome? And and I guess, you know, even at the individual level, is it the individual for you, Peter, or for Roger? Is it the individual in terms of the, the family? Is it just the husband and wife or the kids as well, or all generations? And then if it's a company, is it Peter within a company or Roger within a company or the whole organization? There's that subjectivity. But I'd say ultimately, and this is probably brings us to something we talked about in the past, which is around collaboration. Ultimately, you do need to think about who you, on whose behalf you're doing that and how you make sure that, quote unquote, not colonizing someone else's future and that you're getting all the, I guess, the input and the collaboration that's needed to kind of build for whatever, whether it's a client or whether it's for you or your family, that perception of, of both, you know, possible futures and the ones you might prefer. So it's a very interesting question you raised because that is really the crux of you know in addition to all the difficulties we have in terms of thinking about the future that specific one in terms of who's driving that perception for whose benefit whose preferred future is it is is really um a very interesting additional layer to the whole exercise right yeah ultimately for many of the people it is the sole reason why we're doing the work we're doing yeah, is, It seems noble, but it also seems to be the best we can do, which is to not make things worse and to do our best to make things better because the people who came before us probably tried to do their best as well. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's definitely the case. But I think, you know, these are, to my mind at least, still tools which are, you know, nothing is foolproof, but I guess if you have the right engagement and collaboration and seek out, you know, the diversity of perspectives, you know, everything is in the planning, not necessarily in the plan itself, right? And so I think that's that's still a helpful process, right? Because, you know, none of us are dealing in, in actual predictions. So there's an element which is a, a process and an engagement around turning to the future and thinking about these things. Thanks, Roger.
So we're at the last question. What do you want to discuss with the listeners for your last point? So thanks for the opportunity for this. This is, I often think about, I think, Sue Siegel, who was a GE, who said, you know, two, two, three years ago, the pace of change will never be as slow as it is today. And she said that before the pandemic. And, (laughs) you know, I've been thinking a lot about that, even myself before the pandemic, around what it means, and for want of a better word, all this disruption, right? What does it mean in terms of accelerating technologies as they converge and fuse, you know, which will transform pretty much all industries. What does it mean? We talked about education, you know, the world is still pretty much relying on knowledge-based education systems, longevity, the way we define work today. And I think there's a, there's a real there's a real concern that that one can have around around the preparation for, you know, what is billions of people around around the future and I think it's an existential moment to to reimagine the world, right? To sort of think about, okay, what reset can make sense? And to your point in terms of collaboratively with a collective imagination, to be able to let go and to have the agency of thinking about what one's rebuilding, right? So for me, the final point is really a, a hope that the chaotic times we're going through can be a catalyst for change. And some of it might be, you know, revisiting the likes of Schumpeter with creative destruction. But a lot of it is also, you talked about Zen Buddhism um, earlier. I'm also a huge fan when you think about the concepts of, um, you know, Shoshin, which is the beginner's mind. And in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few, right? And that was, I think, um, you know, the Zen master Suzuki who, who talked about that and you know, many of his disciples were people like Steve Jobs and that. And I really think about where are we doing any of that? Where are we taking a step back? Because the leaders who are meant to look after us, I, you know, I don't have, you know, I don't know about you, but the, necessarily the feeling that they're kind of covering that. I think in, in countries and in particular the US, you know, when you think of education, I think you wonder how you can change education when no one stands to benefit in terms of the current people who are, you know, sucking the system and milking the system, um, how they, why would they be prepared to change it to what Finland does or any other things, right? Because it's in their benefit to have the accreditations and the poor schooling so that people can, you know, pay for additional classes and that. So I think for me, the, the sort of final word is just for us to to understand how much change there will be and that will probably continue. And this, I think, will accelerate even with or without pandemic and even with the resolution to the pandemic. And think about how much agency we have around changing and, and radical transformation. And I'm generally a positive person because, you know, through our discussion earlier around existentialism and the agency we have, but I'm that much less positive if there isn't a sort of collective understanding of where we're at and what's required and the change that's needed and the role we can all have in that. So that's kind of my final little point. I think most of your audience are, you know, acutely aware of all these considerations, but it's really just, you know, getting the message out, things like, you know, what Peter Bishop and others are doing around Teach the Future and and really creating, you know, starting at school, starting in the playground, that mindset so that hopefully future generations will be doing a better job at, at emerging than, than maybe we are. I mean, for me, I talk about hope and hope theories has been one of the important theories that help me understand what it is I do and why I do it. And I think a suggestion I have to you is that is this notion of essence and agency that we have, but also pivoting that over to can you find one other person that you can help them find their agency? Because agency is not, of course, a competitive process. <laughs> if I have my agency, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have less. I fully understand why agency is often starts at a personal existential point. But as a collective, it, I, ju- I just wonder how much more we could do if for the people who find their own agency, then just find one other person who they can help that person find their agency and the exponential effect that could have. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I mean, one of the things I wasn't necessarily going to talk about it, but one of my objectives with uh, something I've labeled Disruptive Futures Institute and um, admittedly disruptive is a, a, a bit of a, 
um, <laughs> dubious word for many, but I, I generally think that we are in the, in that phase. And um, a lot of what I'll be trying to do is is really working with a few a few people to to try and give that you know to help understand the things that are happening and talk about this concept and have some you know ecosystems and collaborations. It's you know nothing in its own right is a solution, but a lot of that I'm I'm planning to do you know for free, and precisely you know not for the corporates or the entrepreneurs or, or for all of these people, but for you know anyone, any age, anywhere in the world. Because I couldn't agree more with you. There's a you know there's a sort of understanding of 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 these things which is which is important and which is not necessarily given in the current institutions and when people go through the normal kind of families and schooling and and what have you it's not necessarily you know taught is maybe not the word but these aren't necessarily the takeaways where i think these youngsters have yeah i think you you raise a very good point and um, i think it's incumbent on all of us to try and see how we can change that especially for for the next generations because once it's more kind of pervasive and across the board as you say one by one it, it reaches a kind of critical mass and uh, exponential effect right and the tipping point hopefully here here roger well on behalf of the future pod community i'd like to thank you for finding some time to have a chat to us and share your ideas uh, i thoroughly enjoyed the interview pleasure was all mine peter it was really nice and um, thanks so much for what you're doing i think it's really um, amazing for, for for everyone out there that you you're giving um, giving this field this voice. Thanks, Roger.